Welcome to this brief presentation about risky behavior and behavior change. I'm Michiel Jan Peters and I work at the Open University of the Netherlands and I research behavior change in nightlife settings. Many um, activities people undertake entail some kind of risk. For example, when people go um, snowboarding or engage in other types of winter sports, around four people um, a year die of this in the Netherlands. Uh, around 21 people a year die out, uh, of swimming and around 12 people per year die because they cycle. These are not the typical risks um, people think of when they think of risky behavior. Often it's about other things like, for example, um, refusing to wear a face mask or um, nightlife, uh, engaging in nightlife settings. Um, we don't exactly know how many people a year die, but there are also some victims there. Uh, for example, um, when people go to big festivals, there are speakers that are several times larger than um, a person and they are quite loud sometimes, so people can get um, hearing damage and people can engage in substance use or in alcohol use. And then you often get campaigns similar to this one, which asks whether alcohol is really that unhealthy. Unfortunately, in case you didn't know the answer yet, I have to disappoint you, the answer is yes. Um, when people think about such risky behaviors and how people process information about those risks and when people think of campaigns, they often emphasize the severity and the susceptibility of the specific risks. Um, from a behavior change perspective, that's not always wise and in fact usually unwise. And that's because of how these risks are processed. If you have a behavior change intervention and you want to achieve behavior change, this behavior change intervention, if it does uh, communicate about risks mostly, it communicates the severity of the risks and the susceptibility of those people. Um, people then start appraising this threat, thinking about whether it's very, um, whether it is actually severe, whether they run a risk. And based on this perceived uh, threat, they either engage in further processing or they stop if they uh, come to the conclusion that, that there is actually not a high threat. If they do come to the conclusion that there's a high threat, they become scared and they're aware of a danger. And then processing continues. Because ideally, such a communication also uh, persuades those people that they are highly self-efficacious, they have a high self-efficacy and they can engage in a certain behavior, a response, and that that response effectively diminishes the threat. So those two elements are also appraised by people. And then you get their perceived efficacy to deal with this threat. If that efficacy uh, is not high, then people engage in fear control because they don't like feeling scared. So they have to do something about this. And then they get defensive reactions such as denial, which many people will recognize if they have family members who are um, avid smokers. They'll, um, for example, defend themselves by saying that they've been smoking for years, a pack a day, and they never noticed anything, or they work out a lot, or they eat a lot of broccoli, or their uncle smoked forever and then died because he got under a bus or whatever. If people have high efficacy, then they can engage in danger control. Then they can um, exhibit some response to decrease the risk. So that's what you want. But in many cases, you don't actually even want to communicate about the risk. Because if you want to change people's behavior, you first have to think about why they actually engage in the behavior. And there are many, many more reasons than risks. People don't only try to minimize risks. They're not machines. And even if we were machines, we wouldn't be programmed simply to minimize risk. So if you have interventions like these examples of Dutch interventions that aim to improve people's well-being and quality of life, they always have to work through the individual themselves. And eventually you want to achieve behavior change, which means you have to change how their muscles work. Basically, the right muscle activity has to take place at the right moment. To do this, you have to change their central nervous system and eventually um, their brain, because that's basically what controls all their behavior. As you probably know by now, our brain consists of very many uh, neurons, around 90 billion of those. Um, to give you some frame of reference, we have around 200 um, billion stars in our galaxy, and there are about 7 billion people on the planet. Uh, and each of those 90 billion neur neurons is connected to roughly 7,000 others on average. So that's basically what you have to change if you want to make sure that people engage less in risky behaviors. Somewhere here we are here, you have to make the right changes such that at the right moment, people engage in different behaviors. They send different signals to their muscles. 
And it's a bit more complicated even, because these people, with their brain and their motor cortex and all those neurons, are actually in an environment. They have people around them, they're sometimes in an organization, in the community, and in the society at large. And there, things happen as well. For example, free condoms are supplied or not, uh, alcohol is available at a party or not, people can have more or less uh, money available to buy healthy food, for example. Um, so in this environment, you have to place these interventions that support people's behavior change. And all those aspects of the environment are also controlled by different people, different stakeholders, different actors. And those people, like for example, hospital boards or organizers of a festival or politicians also have their own interests. They are after all people. So they also have a brain and they also have um, neurons that you eventually will want to change. So again, this is the bottom line. And as I indicated, we have about 90 billion neurons, but they, um, and they have around 7,000 connections, but those connections decrease over time. You have less and less, and that's because you learn. Obviously, people, like other organisms, adapt to the world around us, and that manifests as optimizing the connections you have. So the connections that work well are retained, and others die out. So that means you have less and less connections. And one of these uh, evolved learning processes is habituation, for example, um, if you live in a new house and the stairs is creaky, after a while you don't hear that anymore, whereas a guest will still notice it. This is also why people are actually able to live next to a train station or close to an airport. Another example of one of these learning processes is classical conditioning, where organisms like dogs or humans uh, learn to connect certain stimuli, certain cues in the environment to potential consequences. Or operant conditioning, which you can use if you have a pet or children, where you can use rewards or punishments to decrease or increase behavioral frequency. Vicarious learning is used a lot if you want to change behavior, and it's the ability of uh, organisms to learn through observation of others. I made a very brief animation in PowerPoint to show this. In this scenario, where poor Barney has just died, Fred knows not to go into the bush, even though he hasn't tried it out himself. This is actually the first learning process that evolved over time, where an organism could learn through observation, rather than by having to experience everything themselves through trial and error. Reflective learning is a special learning uh, process, because humans are the only, one, uh, only organism we know so far who can engage in reflective learning. And it basically boils down to thinking back about last week and thinking about a meeting you had or whatever, and then considering whether you actually did the right thing or what you should do differently. So these learning processes evolved over time, and that is why some organisms have other learning processes than other organisms. And these you can actually use in behavior change. So there are um, more overarching methods for behavior change. An example is planning coping responses, which combines two of these evolutionary learning processes. And each of these methods of behavior change have a certain definition and they have um, some guidelines, some parameters for use that you have to stick to to make sure they work, because otherwise they no longer resemble those underlying evolutionary learning principles enough anymore. All these methods have been summarized in books and articles. This article, for example, lists 99 of them. So then the question becomes, which of those 99 methods do you have to use if you want to make sure that people engage less in risky behavior? And the key there is that you talk to people. And when you talk to people, you get answers uh, for their risky behavior. Like for example, this was from a study we did in the Netherlands about a high dose of MDMA. That's uh, a component of the active ingredient of ecstasy pills. Um, and we were wondering why people use a high dose. And then the kind of answers you get are like this. Like, for example, people um, might like the dose of the effects of a high dose more than of a lower dose. Um, they might think their friends all think they should use a high dose. They might not actually be able to get lower dose pills. Um, they might think that if they use a high dose, they can connect to others better. Uh, they might think they get more energy, etc., etc. So you have a lot of reasons that you get from people if you talk to them, if you ask um, why they do what they do. So 
the question is how you connect these reasons to those methods you can use to change their behavior. And that works through theory. Theories basically define which types of reasons together form which psychological constructs. One theory that's used a lot is the reasoned action approach. It was the, it's the successor of something called the theory of planned behavior, which works well for reasoned actions and obviously therefore not for habitual behaviors. We have other theories for those. Um, and that basically states that, for example, anything to do with social norms is called norm. Anything to do with people's belief in their own capability is called self-efficacy. And stuff about um, advantages and disadvantages is called attitude. And then the, the theory itself basically defines these constructs and explains how they should relate to each other. And then these methods you can use for behavior change are organized by construct. And there are a lot of constructs. And within those constructs, you have a lot of those very specific reasons. So basically, if you want to change risky behavior with an intervention, you'll need to make sure that that intervention contains one or several of those methods of behavior change that can actually change people's psychological constructs. More accurately, not even the constructs in general, but the specific components, the specific reasons people have for that behavior. And then hopefully at the right moment, the right signal will be sent and the behavior will change. So this is a kind of causal structural chain that works on the one hand from behavior change principles that you apply in an intervention that then change specific subdeterminants and determinants, and then eventually they change behavior. So it's important to realize that there are many, many determinants. Risky behavior is not determined by people's perceived risk. Whether people engage in risky behavior depends on lots of things, on what their friends do or what they think their friends do, on other benefits they obtain from the behavior, on their habits, etc. So with any risky behavior, if you want to change it, you first have to map all those determinants. So this was a very brief overview of how you can change and approach risky behavior from a behavior change perspective. If um, any of you is more interested, we are writing an open access book that's called the Book of Behavior Change. So if you would like more breakout information, you can uh, look there. Thank you for your attention.